Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to day two of the 2021 Foundation Future Leaders Conference. Um, my name is Gavin Costigan. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation for Science and Technology. If you were with us yesterday, welcome back. Um, and if you missed yesterday, uh, we had two really great sessions and the recordings of those sessions are currently up on our website. So do catch up with them a little bit later. Um, as I said at the start of yesterday's meeting, uh, this conference is being organized by the Foundation Future Leaders and the 2022 Foundation Future Leaders Scheme is currently open for applications. Um, so this is a very quick pitch uh, to encourage any of you who might be interested to think about that. Um, it's a group of 30 early to mid career professionals drawn from three groups. One are civil servants, parliamentary servants in the wider public sector, which might include uh, PSREs. The second group is employees from universities, national facilities, things like that. And that could include catapult centers or research council institutes or research charities. And the third group is people from industry. Uh, and that would also include um, RTOs. So if you are an early to mid career professional from any of those groups and uh, you might be interested uh, in joining uh, uh, the Foundation Future Leaders for next year, do check out the website. I'm going to put the uh, information about that in the chat in just a moment. Um, but for now, let's hand over to day two of the conference and I'm going to hand over to Neil. So over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Gavin, for that introduction to day two and to this session. Um, I hopefully you can see me and hear me now. Uh, so in the first, we've got two sessions today. Uh, I'll be chairing the first se session and our first session is an inclusive and diverse workforce with the right skills. It sits nicely between yesterday's uh, a session looking um, at net zero, is that possible? We had lots of conversations about skills needed there and looking forward to innovation in the, the following session after this one. So we've got two um, really great speakers for us today. Uh, we have Dr. Hayat and Salim, um, followed by Professor Melanie Wellam. Um, so we'll be introducing those in a moment. But after they've given their, um, uh, their presentation, We've got a couple of panel members, uh, with Nick Bennett and Louis Sanger will join us for some Q&As um, to discuss what we've just heard in this session. Uh, so on the matter of Q&As, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please uh, put your questions and thoughts uh, in there using the Q&A function, not the chat function, use the Q&A uh, function. Uh, and that way um, we can also be um, upvoting the questions that you think are really good. And uh, what we'll try and do is we'll try and uh, get the most, um, uh, the most interested questions to uh, talk through and kick about after we've heard from our presenters. So uh, with that, um, our, let me introduce our first speaker. So um, many thanks um, to our first speaker. I, great pleasure I can introduce Dr. Hayat and Selim. Um, she is um, CEO of the Royal Academy of Engineering and CEO of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. She's got extensive experience uh, in engineering, innovation, diversity and inclusion activities. She chairs the St. Andrews Prize for Environment and chaired the UK's government innovation expert group, co-chaired with to Lewis Hamilton, his Commission on Black Representation in UK Motorsport. She's a trustee of Engineering UK and for the Foundation for Science and Technology, who's hosting this uh, conference. A member of Made Smarter Commission on Industry 4.0, a director of Festival UK 2022 Limited, and advisor to Accelerator and the Lloyds Register Foundation. She's been named one of the inspiring 50 women in tech and one of the most influential women in engineering. Uh, a master's in biochem from Oxford and a PhD in cancer research, fellow at IET and honorary professor at UCL, um, made a CBE for services to international engineering. So with that, um, Dr. Hayatim, uh, let me hand over the floor to you. I don't think you're sharing any slides. So if you'd like to turn on your video, I don't know what other people can see, but uh, I can't see much video at the moment. 
Thank you, Neil. I, I have turned on my video, so hopefully other people can see it. Um, and hopefully it's just a brief delay. All right, well, I, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that you can all see me. And thank you so much for inviting me to talk on this incredibly important topic that I'm very passionate about. I'm going to centre my remarks around the three questions that I was posed in advance, which broadly cover equitable access to STEM careers, how we can improve diversity and inclusion within STEM careers and skills in a changing world. And thank you, Caroline, that's very reassuring. So for context, maybe just worth pointing out that as Neil mentioned, I did start out as a biochemist working in medical research and I moved into the world of engineering and science policy. And now of course run the Royal Academy of Engineering where advancing diversity and inclusion is one of our highest priorities. And all of those will inform the comments that I'm then going to share with you today. So let's start with this question of equitable access to STEM. I'm going to first of all use the lens of gender. We often talk about the importance of getting more girls interested in STEM. And that sounds absolutely critical and, and, and an obviously good thing to do, but it's perhaps careful, perhaps we need to be more careful about the precision of that statement, because in fact, there's a huge variation in the uptake across the various letters that make up the STEM acronym. So if you use the HESA definition of science, so the, the, um, uh, the, the definition of science used by the Higher Education Statistics Agency, over 40% of higher education enrolments in science subjects are by women, it's over 40%. And if you drill down further, you see that in subjects like medicine and dentistry, women are in a majority, roughly 60%, and they make up nearly 80% of enrolments in subjects allied to medicine. For physical sciences and maths, women make up about 40% of enrolments. But for engineering and technology and computing, enrolments by women are down to below 20%. So this spectrum really matters the precursor subjects to studying a subject like engineering and, and to study medicine are actually very similar. So if we keep on focusing on trying to get more girls interested in STEM, we risk missing an important point. And that point, from my perspective, is that we've developed in the UK a highly gendered view of certain subjects in a way that's both erroneous and dangerous. So at the Royal Academy of Engineering, we're working hard to change the outdated and highly gendered perceptions of engineering so that we can overturn this lazy visual shorthand of a man in a hard hat and a high vis jacket and show the true diversity and opportunities that come with modern engineering careers. We're doing that in um, a variety of ways, but in particular through a campaign called This Is Engineering. And since we launched that campaign in 2018, our videos have been viewed over 54 million times by a largely gender balanced audience of UK teenagers. We would welcome everyone's help in getting the message out there that engineering is for everyone. Engineers shape our world and it's vital that they reflect the society that we serve. So let's move on to the race and ethnicity lens. As uh, Neil mentioned, over the past year, I had the slightly surreal and unexpected honour of co-chairing with the Formula One driver, Sir Lewis Hamilton, his commission on improving the representation of black people in STEM roles in UK motorsport. And because we had quite a narrow focus, we were able to take a systems view of the problem. We reached right back down into the school system. So I thought I'd share some of the findings from the research we undertook. It's a really complex area and there's a lot of detail in the report if you'd like to know more. What we saw was a gap that opens up really very early between the experiences and the attainment of black Caribbean students and their peers in a way that's highly likely to impact on whether they can and will pursue STEM subjects at higher levels. So by GCSE, you see that black Caribbean students are less likely to take triple science, which of course you usually need to go on for higher study in STEM subjects. They're less likely to attain the highest grades in STEM subjects, and they are more likely to be excluded from school. Now, Intersectionality, the fancy word for saying that um, different personal and protected characteristics interact with each other is really important here. So you see that socioeconomic deprivation plays an important part, but that alone cannot account for all the differences. So what can we do about these troubling findings? Well, the Hamilton Commission recommended a range of actions from ensuring that STEM inspiration and engagement activities are properly targeted and accessible to all groups, not least black Caribbean students and their families. And that could involve working with organizations like the Association for Black and Minority Ethnic Engineers. It could involve working with supplementary schools run by members of the black, of black communities. It also recommended that we improve the number of black teachers in schools, especially in STEM subjects, which are currently really, really low and developing an exclusion to innovation fund so that we can help to explore other ways to use um, to reduce the use of exclusions and mitigate their negative impacts. The Academy is currently undertaking a study on social mobility in engineering. So hopefully I'll be able to say more on that in the future. I think that social mobility lens is very important too. 
but also, I don't have any data to share at this point. I would in the meantime flag a nationwide festival of STEAM that I'm involved with. And when I say STEAM, please can you think STEM plus arts rather than celebrating the STEAM power of the Industrial Revolution. The festival is called Unboxed Creativity in the UK. And it's a huge opportunity to undertake public engagement around STEM through 10 projects all around the UK, including in many areas which have what we might call low science capital. So where communities typically have limited knowledge and experience of engaging with science and engineering. And lastly, before I move on to the experience of those who do make it into STEM careers, just wanted to note that choosing a STEM qualification at university or college doesn't guarantee a job. A few years ago at the Academy, we conducted some analysis that showed that black and minority engineering graduates, so black and minority ethnic engineering graduates, were twice as likely to be unemployed post-graduation than their white counterparts, even when you control for the class of degree and the type of university. And in response to this very troubling finding, the Academy created a programme called the Graduate Engineering Engagement Programme, or GEEP for short, to improve the transition of engineering graduates from underrepresented groups into engineering employment, by working on the one hand with students to an un increase the know-how and confidence that they have when it comes to applying for these jobs, and on the other hand with employers to try to eliminate bias in their recruitment processes. The results so far are very encouraging and we're looking to scale up, so if you're interested, please do contact me afterwards. Okay, so let's talk a bit about careers. <clears throat> for those that do make it into STEM careers, what's their experience and how can we improve that? In 2017, the Academy conducted some research into the culture in engineering, drawing on the experiences of some 7,000 engineers that yielded some really interesting insights. First of all, it showed us that there was a distinctive culture in engineering, which has positives such as being team-based, problem-solving, um, and then some perhaps more negative uh, traits such as a strong attachment to tradition. But perhaps most importantly, not surprisingly, but importantly, it showed us that your experience of working in engineering differs depending on a whole range of characteristics. For example, LGBT plus engineers, disabled engineers, black or minority ethnic engineers were less likely to say they felt included than their counterparts. While, for example, Muslim engineers were twice as likely to say they'd been bullied or harassed in the past year than respondents with no religion. But taken together, the results also pointed to something that we call the inclusion privilege, which means that those who already feel included, who typically come from the majority groups, are least likely to see the need to take action. Because you feel included, you don't feel that there is this burning platform to address diversity and inclusion. And I would suggest that this has definitely been something that we across the science and engineering communities have been guilty of. We love to think we're evidence led, we're highly rational, but how can anyone believe, for example, that the low representation of black people in senior roles is the outcome of a system where excellence always prevails? The inclusion privilege arises because by definition, those who've made it into leadership roles either haven't experienced or have in other ways managed to navigate or surmount the obstacles that are detrimentally impacting on so many people's experiences. So that can make those of us in senior roles less likely to take action and to acknowledge the differential experience of others. I think we've got to this point where we really have to front up and be willing to look bias in the eye. It's real, we all have it. And if we're truly honest with ourselves, we'll realize that we've all seen it. We've been subject to it perhaps, and we've acted on it at some point. Let me give you just a couple of examples from my own experience. When I worked in research, along with all the other minority ethnic scientists that I knew, um, it was quite common to be mistaken for a cleaner or a technician. For some people, this was a subject to laugh about. For others, it was deeply hurtful. When I was appointed to this job, I encountered this incredible stream of people who had to rapidly rearrange their facial expressions when it turned out that I was the chief executive of the academy. I clearly wasn't what people were expecting when they visualized the chief exec of the Royal Academy of Engineering. But inclusion requires us all to retain a very healthy dollop of humility and to acknowledge that it's much easier to spot bias in other people than in yourself. A few years ago, I had an experience where I went into a room and I was going to chair the meeting. I went to get a cup of tea and somebody standing next to the tea and coffee said, oh, good, there's someone here to pull the coffee. I said, well, I'm having tea and the coffee's over there because I didn't want to make a scene, but I also didn't want to pour his coffee. When he went to try and get his coffee, I realized he had a disability that meant he needed assistance pouring his coffee. He'd made an assumption about me and I'd made one right back about him. So if we accept that bias is everywhere, including in STEM, what can we do to create more inclusive cultures within STEM? It's a huge topic and I'll just pick out a couple of things. 
Firstly, while we can never eradicate bias, we can certainly do a better job of firstly, building our self-awareness, and secondly, developing our capacity for empathy. And while there's lots that we can do simply by starting from that point of humility, openness, and a desire to listen and learn, I'd love to see us also using tech to help us accelerate that process, using technology like VR and gamification to help us deepen our empathy for different groups and perspectives beyond our own. The consultancy PwC have produced a really interesting product to help with this. Personally, I'm disappointed there hasn't been more of this coming out of the STEM community. We have the creativity, we have the technical know-how to do something extraordinary. The second point I'd like to make is that if we want to improve representation of different groups at all levels within our organisations, we all have to take more responsibility for the pipeline. If we wait for the system to self-correct spontaneously, we will be waiting far too long. Again, a couple of very quick examples that we're using at the Academy in this context within our research programmes to try to boost the proportion of underrepresented groups among our Academy grant holders. So for our flagship early career research scheme, our research fellows, we already have demand management in place that limits the numbers of applications that any university can submit. And what we've done over the time is to allow universities to, to submit an extra candidate if they come from an underrepresented group. And we're now increasing that so that typically a university will get two slots, two candidates they can put forward, plus a further two if those candidates come from underrepresented groups. What happens thereafter is that all applicants are assessed in the same way. Another example is access mentoring so that people from underrepresented groups can receive mentoring support to help them at that pre-application stage to make sure that they understand the process of review and can submit a really good application. Thereafter, again, they're treated alongside all the other applications. So lastly, I'd like to just say a few words about this notion of skills in a changing world. I'd like to talk about how the changing pace of technology is impacting on our skills requirements and how we meet them. I have two young children, they're 10 and 12, and when I look at the education system that they're experiencing, and then the way the world is changing, I can't help feeling that there is a growing disconnect, notwithstanding the huge efforts of their teachers. The relative value of knowledge acquisition versus transferable skills such as problem solving, creativity, critical thinking and resilience, which we at the Academy would call engineering habits of mind, is shifting rapidly towards the latter. I also think that the UK's early specialisation and somewhat linear view of education is something that is not going to serve as well as we look to the future. We're going to need to be much more flexible to think much more about talent circulation and invest more in opportunities for upskilling, for reskilling, for career conversion. The vast majority of the workforce of 2030 has already left full time education. And we're seeing digitisation, Industry 4.0, the quest for net zero all come together to shift the patterns of jobs across a wide range of industries in a very profound way, with, which is creating both winners and losers, but also lots of potential for people whose jobs are disappearing to migrate into those growth areas. So this kind of talent circulation, this idea that you migrate from one career path onto another, is also a route to helping us shift our persistent diversity deficits, because it means you don't have to think about changing the gendered environment in which our three-year-olds grew up in and then to, to, to kind of grow, every, grow everyone from scratch. So I've seen some great examples of large corporates as well as charities support career conversions, in particular career conversions into tech. To give again one specific example, um, I met a fantastic software engineer working in cybersecurity who'd started out as an occupational psychologist. She brings to bear all that prior experience and expertise alongside her technical expertise in her role in cybersecurity. What is not to love about that? There is real value in having people who've been trained in different disciplines and who work at the boundaries between disciplines. And I sometimes feel that, perhaps a bit skeptical, that people in academia don't really believe this is a career path that you can convert into in later, later in life. But I think we probably need to recognize that our mental model of how careers work is, is outdated and we need to think more creatively about what our STEM workforce is going to look like in years to come. We've got to think about career chapters rather than this traditional sort of linear concept of a career path. I can see this happening, but we have to acknowledge that we're actually perhaps lagging behind our peer group already. So for a long time, our investments in adult skills, in continuing professional development in both the public and private sector, has lagged behind uh, compared to countries like Singapore and that we have currently very poor signposting and quality control for people who do want to make career changes, who do want to upgrade their skills later in life. This is a huge collective challenge. It's also an area where government 
and the private sector as well as professional bodies are going to need to come together to collaborate. And I see a very strong role for those of us who are involved in professional training and accreditation to contribute to this wider skills transformation. We need to make sure that we're training and assessing people in what I would call a future facing way. What do I mean by that? I mean that we're making sure we're imparting and assessing the skills that people will actually need to be effective in this changing world. It's inevitably going to involve a greater emphasis on digital skills. That's already happening to some extent, but also a much clearer focus on sustainability, on ethics, on inclusive leadership, on the role of STEM professionals in tackling these really, really complex socio-technical systems that underpin society and lie at the intersection of the technical workforce and societal need. And while I don't think that many educators or professional bodies or policymakers would argue with that, I also don't think that many of us could say that we're fully prepared for this significant shift in our priorities or that we're moving at the pace that societal need requires us to. So some of what I've said in this talk might sound a bit negative. I spent a long time pointing out the diversity deficits that we face. I've talked about all these things that we have to do and have to do better and have to do faster. But actually I am an optimist and I see real change happening in our community. For the first time, I see many, if not most senior leaders, perhaps chivied along by their more junior colleagues, accepting that improving the diversity of our workforce, fostering an inclusive culture, enabling equitable access is a core part of our jobs. And I see more leaders being willing to be held accountable for that. I see a growing acknowledgement that prioritizing diversity and inclusion does not mean deprioritizing excellence. And this is vital because this false dichotomy between diversity and inclusion on the one hand and excellence on the other has persisted far too long in our community. And it's part of why change has come so slowly. And I'm seeing the institutions and government and academia and industry being much more collaborative, accepting that we can't do this alone. And it's our, it's our duty to do this in a collaborative way if we want to drive change faster. And that's a lovely segue into what Melanie is going to talk about, because she's going to talk about the R&D people and culture strategy, which is, I think, a great embodiment of the, this change that is happening. And I'm very look, much looking forward to being part of making that a reality. So I'll finish by saying thank you so much for inviting me to talk to you and for putting this topic so high on the agenda. You know, that is the kind of leadership that we need. And I really appreciate all that you are doing to make sure that we do drive this positive change. Thank you so much. Great, that was fantastic. Um, it's really good to hear. My my mind is buzzing with questions, but that's uh, not my prerogative. My my prerogative, uh, as you say, as you nicely said, is uh, to introduce our next speaker. So thank you very much, Fayatim. Uh, we will come back to you when the panel is up and running with uh, lots of questions. But for now, um, thank you again. And uh, let me introduce our second speaker. Uh, so Professor Melanie Wellam, um, welcome. It's great for you to join us today. Uh, Melanie is the Executive Chair of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, BBSRC. That's part of UKRI. She joined in October 2012 as a Director of Science, initially on secondment from the University of Bath. At the University of Bath, Melanie was a leading researcher in molecular signaling and stem cell science. She has a degree in biochemistry from Imperial College, PhD from University College London, and undertook postdoctoral research um, at the University of British Columbia in Canada. She's currently a member of the Board of Trustees of the Human Frontier Science Programme Organisation and serves on the governing board for Science Europe. Professor Wellam has long been an advocate for equality, diversity and inclusion, playing a leadership role and engaging in activities to promote the EDI agenda. Alongside leadership of BBSIC, she's also the UK RI Executive Champion for People, Culture and Talent. There we go. So welcome, Melanie. Uh, I invite you to uh, take the virtual floor. Your slides are showing, so over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Neil. And, and thank you very much to the FST for inviting me to, um, to present to you today. It really is a pleasure. Um, and, and I, you know, as, as Hayatun had said, and interesting that we both have a background in biochemistry and, and I guess we've both diversified our careers. So I'm sure there's some things that we can, we can take away from that and maybe discuss a little bit later. Um, but really what I want to focus on, I think within the context of those three questions um, that, that Hayatun has, has explained, 
explored in her presentation is really focusing on how we're building and supporting a diverse, inclusive and sustainable research innovation system. Because I think for lots of reasons, this is actually going to be critical um, for our, our future place in the world. Um, I just want to start off really by introducing you to UKRI because some of you may not be familiar with us. So we are an organisation that was established in 2018 that brought together seven of the discipline facing research councils were all, that were all arms length bodies um, of government um, of the uh, Department for Business energy and industrial strategy brought us together with Research England and Innovate UK to create one organisation and we invest in, in research and innovation by partnering with academia and business um, right across different disciplines, right across the UK and internationally. <clears throat> and last year UKRI set out in our corporate plan, what our vision was um, for the research and innovation sector and also our mission in helping to deliver that vision. This is set out on the slide and it recognises that it's a very complex landscape involving many people, involving many different organisations. And at, at the highest possible level, the, the vision that we have is that, you know, we want the UK to have an outstanding research and innovation system, but one in which everyone feels that they can contribute and equally everyone feels that they can benefit. And this really requires for that system to be diverse, inclusive, equitable. As UKRI, we, what do we see as our mission in, in helping to achieve that vision, helping to deliver it? Well, we see that we have a really important role as convening different partners and working in collaboration, catalyzing, investing in, in the best ideas so that we can build that thriving system in which people and ideas and our diversity of people and ideas can really, um, can, can really grow and, and, and thrive. Um, and importantly, connecting our investments, which um, you know, are investments that come from the taxpayer to that public good, and whether that's economic benefit, whether that's societal benefit, all of those things we, we want to ensure. Um, so really sort of, I then want to explain why that diversity and inclusion is so important. And as we've already heard this morning, um, diversity and inclusion do really matter. And there are different challenges in different sectors of our research and innovation system. So it's important that we recognize that and some of the interventions will be different. But we know from studies from that have been um, undertaken by a number of organizations, this is from a report from McKinsey last year, that there is a real um, bonus for those organizations that have diverse teams. So both from a gender perspective and from an ethnicity perspective, companies that are in the top 25% um, centile actually are more likely to be um, profitable and, and to, be, um, to be more creative, more productive um, than companies that do not have such a diverse um, workforce. And that's just illustrated in this slide. And it builds on many other ideas. So we know that there are real positive benefits from focusing on diversity and inclusion, and, and these really matter. If we look at STEM workforce data, and as Hayaten has already um, explained, you know, it's it's it can hide differences across the different STEM areas. But I think some of these data, even at a collective level, are really rather stark. If you look at gender and compared to people who are in the STEM workforce compared to the rest of the workforce, we only see 27% of women in STEM subjects across the piece. Um, so there's a real disparity there. Um, disability, there is also um, underrepresentation in STEM areas and also in some ethnic groups they are underrepresented in STEM areas. And this is particularly acute when we drill down and look across those different areas. But at this highest level, we see that there is so much more potential for improving the diversity and the inclusivity of um, people working across the research and innovation system. These data um, are from the WISE campaign and from HESA, and they're a few years old now, but I think they illustrate that point about the difference across different STEM subjects. 
So my own area of the biological sciences, we're very fortunate, you could say, in that when we look at, at STEM qualifications up to postgraduate level, there's actually an over-representation of, of females um, within that. Whereas when we actually look into academia, only 26%, and it's probably very similar data now, maybe 27% of people holding professorial contracts are women. However, when you look across engineering and technologies and mathematics, the situation is really quite different as Hayatun has already described. So we really need to understand what's happening in these different areas so that we can um, improve the inclusivity and the interventions and the approaches we take will need to be really tailored to those different areas because this is a very complex area and many factors are at play. As part of the work that UKRI are doing, and as because we're the largest public funder of research and innovation in the UK with an 8 billion budget every year, that's, that's a tremendous um, amount of investment and leverage there. Um, when we look, we've, we've been looking and we commit to publishing openly our data on our funding programmes. And currently we collect data on age, disability, ethnicity and gender. And these are the collective data across all of UKRI funding. We've, we've published the drill down data by our particular disciplines as well so that you can see how this varies depending on the area of support. Um, but again, we see differences across all of these different areas um, between whether it's gender, ethnicity, disability and age. We need to understand the shape of our funding system so that we can understand where the particular areas are that would potentially be the, the areas that if we could make improvements, if we could design things differently, we could actually make the most difference. And if we drill down a little bit into um, looking at both applications and awards um, for two of those different categories, so for gender and for ethnic minorities, we see that the number of, of female applicants and awardees has been increasing over the last five year period, um, particularly in, in the yellow lines there around fellowships. So we're really seeing successful female applicants coming through and being supported. Um, we also see an increase in applications from people identifying as ethnic minorities, which again is really, really positive. However, when we look at the proportion of awardees, we don't see the, the proportionality is slightly different. So whilst we're seeing increases, they're not being as successful. So we need to understand what it is about our processes and about our systems, which is um, resulting in this outcome. Because ideally, we would want to see parity between proportions of applications and awards. So there's more we need to do. And I think the people and culture strategy, which has already been referred to, which was published in July by um, our parent department, um, really sort of brings um, many of these different things together and starts to think about it in a systematic, holistic way. So UKRI worked really closely with colleagues at Bayes in developing this strategy. And the strategy sets out to sort of create a more inclusive, dynamic, productive and sustainable research and innovation sector in the UK. Um, a system where you know, a diversity of people and ideas can thrive. And it really is a call to action. And it really recognizes that this isn't somebody else's problem. This won't be solved by individuals, but it requires everyone across the system to reflect and understand what role they can play and what role they can lead in bringing about that lasting change. And importantly, it recognizes that people are at the heart of the R&D system. So we need to think about skills. We need to think about career paths, porosity across career paths, flexibility, leadership, culture, incentive, attracting global, globally mobile talent. And in the next few slides, I'll take through a little bit more in a little bit more detail of people and culture strategy and also then come on to some examples from UKRI and some of the activities that we've been taking forward that are starting to address some of these quite knotty and long-term issues. We recognize it's difficult, there aren't going to be quick wins. We really have to be dedicated to this over the longer term. So the strategy itself really centers on three key areas, people, culture, and talents. And in this slide, I've sort of set out what the success would look like in these areas. Should we be successful in taking forward that strategy and really driving and bringing about that change? 
So it's about attracting people with the right skills across all roles. It's not just I mean, as an academic background, it's not just about academia, it's about all the people con who contribute to the success in academia, the professional support service, the technical e experts, um, and more broadly. Um, we need to think about variation in career paths. How can we retrain people? How can we attract people in? How can we make the environment attractive and supportive to those people? And I think particularly in academia, there are real opportunities for us to develop leadership at, at all levels. Um, and, and I see this particularly as someone who's transitioned from working in the academic sphere to working in the policy field. Culture is really important, you know, as well as attracting people, we need to be sure that we have a supportive environment that enables those people to thrive and is respectful for those people. We need to reward and recognise and incentivize people um, for excellent research and innovation, but to broaden the, what we're actually recognizing, the contributions that we're recognizing in that area. They're currently very tightly defined and that drives lots of behaviors which are actually rather unhelpful. So we're working towards thinking how we can, how we can um, re review what that reward and recognition system looks like. And we want to attracts people of all backgrounds to be inspired into research and innovation careers. Um, I was really um, passionate about biology when I was at school, but I was the first person in my family to go to university. We didn't have a framework around that. Um, and, and I lived in a very rural area of East Anglia. So I feel that I sort of have that lived experience of going in there. And I would really like other people um, to feel that they too has something for, to offer for them too. And clearly, you know, we want to ensure that the UK is a really attractive place for top talent. You know, talent is globally mobile. How can we ensure that the UK attracts and retains um, skilled people um, and for that exchange of ideas, which is so important? So UKRI has a really important role in, in delivering the people and culture strategy. Um, there are over 20 commitments in the strategy, um, but it's not for us alone to deliver that. It's very much about working in partnership and collaboration with others. But clearly, because we are a, a significant funder and because we have levers around that, it's really important that we take a lead in particular areas, and that's what we're doing. And, and we recognise that a lot of our systems and processes will drive behaviours in the system, So and, and how we can use those to influence the system to really drive forward that change I think is really important and with all of these things we do really want to make sure that we're collecting data we're using an evidence-based approach and we're sharing that with partners and, and exchanging knowledge with partners also. Um, so we were sort of nesting our activities um, in four key interrelated areas. And I think this is the real point that we, we have to think about this systemically, we have to think about this holistically. Many of these elements are interconnected and there will be consequences of changing, of having inputs into one part of the system that will impact the other part of the system. And we really need to understand this in an integrated way. So in terms of the what, we've sort of um, thinking about this in four different ways, thinking about the capacity, the capability, the culture and behaviour. And to illustrate how we're thinking about that, and I hope you can read some of this writing, I appreciate it's rather small on the slide, um, but it, you know, in terms of capacity, we need to think about how we're attracting people into the, um, the career pathway for research innovation um, to ensure that people see that it could be something for them. So thinking about a new deal for postgraduate research, are there barriers for postgraduates to enter into research and innovation? And thinking about, you know, are there hostile cultures, so particularly around um, tackling bullying and harassment. In terms of capability, I've already mentioned, you know, developing leadership skills at all levels. Um, but I think it's also about um, thinking how we can attract people and how we can get a broader diversity of people through different placements, um, experiences of learning, working across disciplines, working across sectors. Um, that porosity, I think, is actually really important. In terms of culture, we need to think about how we can foster that really inclusive, respectful culture that supports Supports people and that and that people feel that they want to that they want to work within and are inspired to do that. Um, and work that is ongoing is very active at the moment in UK is developing our um, equality, diversity, and inclusion strategy that we'll be um, launching a draft of for consultation um, next month. 
and we welcome really wide feedback um, on that. In, in terms of behaviour, um, we're thinking about how we assess, because we know that what we measure will um, drive and influence behaviours. So we really need to think quite carefully about are we assessing the things that will support a positive um, and respectful research culture? Or are some of the things that we're measuring actually driving particular behaviours that can lead to impacts in, 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 and you know, issues with, around bullying and harassment? So actually going to be taking sort of an end-to-end -end review of our um, how we use expert peer review to ask some of those questions about the criteria that we're using and how that might influence behaviours, what we're actually um, measuring in terms of contributions to assess that excellence and excellence is really important but we have to think about how we're defining excellence I think um, and we're also we've been piloting um, the use of a narrative CV which is based on the Royal Society's resume for researchers and we're gathering um, evidence from that we'll be publishing guidance to help applicants and to help um, their, their research offices around that. But this is so that we can broaden the contributions that we're actually measuring from people um, beyond the traditional in academia anyway, you know, papers, journal publications and grants. But again, I emphasize that, that the key in all of this is to understand how these all of these things interact and how we need to think about these things holistically and how it really requires the system and all the individuals within that system to come together to help to affect the change. It's not someone else's issue, it's we should all have ownership and show leadership here. So I just want to provide a few case studies about some of the activities that UKRI is undertaking to help deliver this people and culture strategy. And, and as I have I hope I've emphasized it's not that we are doing this in isolation, but we are working very closely with the community, with, um, the, with the academies, with learning societies, with business and other organizations, because we really need to make sure that we are moving forward as a system um, with these different areas so we can really affect that change. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at and consulting on is, is um, how we're attracting students into postgraduate research and how we're supporting those students. So this is the new deal for postgraduate research. There are four areas that we'll be looking at. Um, I'd be interested if anyone feels that there's anything that's possibly missing from that. And we will be again consulting broadly with the community on that. We want to think about models and access. We want to think about levels of financial support and funding, the rights and conditions and the routes in and through and trying to identify where there are barriers, particularly for some underrepresented groups in this area. Um, because you know, it's so important that we're actually attracting people in at this stage. We then have to make sure that we can create an environment that sustains um, their careers. Um, tackling bullying and harassment is, is high on the agenda and UKRI um, is chairing the forum for tackling bullying and harassment, which is bringing together funding policy and other organizations, both from the UK and internationally, with the aim of really supporting system level change in this area. So it's about raising awareness to bring about the culture change that, we've, that we, we all feel is really important to, in order to, to, to really um, enable that healthy research culture, working collaboratively to explore and to share learning and understanding where other people have taken steps and approaches, um, and also promoting collaboration so that we can um, reduce um, you know, bureaucracy in this area. We want to make it enabling and straightforward for people. So this is a really important area of what we're, we're doing. And then a couple of examples um, of work that we've been undertaking in BBSRC. So we support um, doctoral training through a number of collaborative doctoral training programs. And we have recognized in our own funding data that we have real underrepresentation of black um, students within our PhD cohorts and also within um, our principal investor cohorts as well. So we've been working with our doctoral training programs in order to encourage them to um, pilot interventions to um, really try and address this underrepresentation and to empower young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, from underrepresented backgrounds, um, to consider 
um, a programme in a PhD training in the biosciences. This is an example from London interdisciplinary doctoral programme um, <clears throat> where they have supported tailored mentoring and training programmes um, and they have now, the data demonstrates that through the programmes that they have actually put in place, that they really increase the number of minority applicants who are making it through to interview. That is a really good example of how things can actually work. And I know the University of Nottingham have a similar programme where they are offering mentoring support um, to applicants and they actually have a guaranteed interview system as well, which is really increasing the diversity of the students who are interviewed for those doctoral training programmes. So I think there's much we can learn from these approaches. Innovate UK has had a really successful programme since 2016 supporting women in innovation. They have seen through this um, programme of su tailored support for female innovators, a 70% increase in the number of women who are registering for Innovate UK support, which is a fantastic increase. And I know they are keen to actually do more. And I've met with um, a number of their cohorts in the past um, and it's really inspiring to see these women coming together um, and the support that they actually have. So whilst this is a small program, I think it has ambitions um, to increase its reach as well and is demonstrating success. So it really works. In thinking about career pathways and movement across career pathways and development of new skills, at a UKRI level, we've been supporting an innovation scholars program, which enables um, individuals to move between different sectors and that can be between academia the NHS or with business um, and the, you know it benefits not only the the person who is seconded into those different sectors in their career but also the organization often that they are seconded into and in BBSRC we've been supporting flexible talent mobility accounts over the last few years um, which enables um, early career researchers and technical experts to move between um, academia and industrial settings. Um, over 280 people have been supported since we've launched that and there's some great and really positive feedback from the people who've taken part and that it's enabled them to develop new skills and consider different um, career path tracks as well. Um, and sort of my last example really is around global mobility and why um, that is an important part of the people and culture strategy. So we recognise um, that, you know, research and innovation benefit um, from international collaboration and the circulation of skills and ideas around the world. Uh, and we've worked uh, very closely with Home Office on the Global Talent Visa, which is an immigration route for individuals coming to the UK to work in specific sectors, including in research innovation. UKRI can now endorse applications for researchers working on funded projects from over 80 domestic um, and international funders. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Um, we're also looking at how some of the other elements of the people and culture strategy um, in this um, talent area, where we can support that to, to make um, improvements as well. So it, it, it's looking at evidence about um, international mobility, about sort of trends and directions of travel, working with the Office for Talent to launch an online service service to attract highly talented individuals to the UK um, and, and how we can actually improve the highly skilled migration routes for top talent um, and including we're looking at the UKRI short-term mobility scheme that we currently have. So um, I want to um, finish there, but just sort of to, to summarise, you know, we, we do see underrepresentation in certain groups um, across the STEM areas, but this is different. Um, as we've, have, as, as both myself and Hayatin have, have recognised um, across that area. And there are complex reasons as to why um, there is that underrepresentation. We really need to understand that if we are actually going to start to tackle that and, and to, um, but importantly as part of that, I think creating that inclusive and diverse system is going to be absolutely critical to that because you know having a diverse group of people and supporting a diverse group of ideas is actually what we need to realize if we want to benefit from the full potential of research and innovation in the UK. And I guess I just sort of want to close with a question to you as a, as a cohort of future leaders is, how can you see yourselves playing a role and how might you be able to help with this, um, with this very broad and, um, and challenging but 
but really rewarding um, area. So I will stop there and um, thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie. That's um, really interesting. And um, I hope to hear uh, lots of answers to your question, um, as well as uh, hearing some more questions from my colleagues. Um, and there are lots of questions coming in at the moment. So um, please, everyone, um, submit your questions and upvote the ones that are um, you think are, are the ones you want our panel to answer. On that note, um, let me introduce um, our two other panelists. Um, so um, first of all, uh, all of our panelists, why don't you turn your um, cameras on? Um, and first of all, I'm going to introduce Nick Bennett. Uh, so Nick, he's a, another of our Foundation for Science and Technology Future Leaders cohort. Um, he's an independent safety and environmental auditor working for Defence Equipment and Support, or DENS, if you like the three-letter acronyms. In working with the MOD's procurement agency, he's responsible for assuring product systems and services are safe by design. Me mechanical engineering apprentice by background, he's enjoyed a varied career across the public sector, including recent deployments in support of the COVID-19 effort. Uh, and with him, we also have Louise. Louise is one of the uh, Foundation's future leaders, uh, again. She works for the Lloyd's Register Foundation, an independent global charity that supports research, innovation and education to make the world a safer place. She's developing a hindsight perspective program to provide historical insights to support the contemporary safety challenges, deepen the understanding of issues and promote wider engagement. She's a maritime historian by background and her research inter interests focus on maritime safety and regulatory processes. So uh, good panel then before us. Um, thank you guys. First of all, I'm going to ask Nick and then Louise to just give a, a bit of a reflection on the um, two presentations we've heard this morning. So Nick, um, uh, why don't you unmute yourself and uh, uh, tell us what you think. Uh, thanks, Neil, and good morning, everybody. So uh, yeah, thank you for having me as part of the panel this morning. Um, and thank you to Houghton and uh, Melanie for the speeches uh, or presentations. They were, they were fantastic and really insightful into some of the work that's going on into, in the wider space. I suppose from my perspective, um, the, the takeaways and sort of thoughts that I've fabricated in my mind focus around the need for a collective effort on this uh, and the need for transparency and collaboration. Um, in my job with the Ministry of Defence, um, I obviously look at the safety of products and systems that we procure for our armed forces. Um, and it's a really interesting cultural space because unlike other aspects of business, safety kind of uh, takes precedent over everything and it's a common goal. No one wants to cause any harm for people. And I sort of see, uh, you know, the challenges we have around diversity and inclusivity in the same sort of space. It's something we all want to achieve and it's all something we're aspiring towards. Um, and because of that common goal, I think there's um, a real will across industry, academia, public sector, wherever you look to try and improve the situation. Um, and, and one thing I'd like to do is, is kind of build those bridges between the different um, institutions, establishments um, and sectors so that we can all learn from one another in achieving said goal. Um, because it's obvious we're all looking at this and it's obvious we're all collecting data on this and it's obvious we're all trying to do the right thing in this area. But what I'd like to see is to take those lessons that we're all learning individually uh, and ensure that they're um, transmitted across the enterprise so that we can all collectively benefit from the work that we're all doing. Um, so that's, I suppose, my aim. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I can go into some more detail on some of the work that I'm doing uh, within the effect, uh, defense sector on that subject. But I'll, I'll hand over to Louise and, and let her uh, give herself an introduction and let her know her thoughts. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Nick. And, uh, <laughs> Thanks to Melanie and Hyatton as well for some really interesting, um, engaging thoughts. Um, the one I want to sort of um, pick up on is um, that sort of big picture approach and looking at, um, you know, the engineers of the future and what skills are going to be needed, um, especially what skills to keep us safe as the world changes. 
um, like rethinking the engineer of the future, the way they're educated needs to, you know, constantly evolve to keep pace with new technologies and the increasing urgency of um, climate change, increased populations and stresses on resources. Um, so there's going to be new theories and approaches to the practice of learning, which you both touched upon um, to help to meet these needs. Um, and also looking at the skills and the safety of future workers um, as demographic changes, as we strive to have a more inclusive and diverse workforce, we need more occupational health and safety to make sure that we can equip the world with the skills, but also ensure that they're safe in their, in their work. Um, and looking at um, the future world, the, you know, the rapidly changing world population, um, large scale industry in the next 20 years, it's going to increasingly be focused on Africa, Southeast Asia, and it's estimated Africa alone is going to need about 10 million new engineers in the next 20 years. So it's that sharing, that collaborative approach that Nick mentioned, sharing of the knowledge, the skills and engaging a global community. Um, and helping those engineers to, to get the competencies that they need. Um, and if looking ahead to, you know, to 2040, the plans for the infrastructure and all the developments are going ahead already. Um, and there's going to be massive changes in demographics and consumer behaviours and the pressures on the energy and the transport systems, communications, living systems. And it's, it really is like you've all said about governments and companies working together collaboratively to, to address the challenges. Um, and then different paces of change as well, infrastructure and technologies, they can develop at very different paces. You can launch a smartphone every couple of years, but you can't just introduce a railway that quickly. So it's that visionary thinking, that long-term investment and forward planning, um, but also um, thinking of new, new energy transitions coming through as future fusion transitions from the lab to a commercial energy source. There'll be all types of new skills required. Um, we'll need the people to build the power stations, the engineers to build the machines, all the components. So there are so many different opportunities, different skill sets that, that are going to be needed. Um, and retaining and retraining the talent that we have, as you said, is key a lot of people have already left education so it's looking at what people are already working in those industries and and what do they want for their career pathways how can we make sure that they feel included um, and that those opportunities are, are available to them um, and that was my takeaway so thank you okay uh, excellent. Thank you, Louise. And there's um, lots of questions coming in. Um, there's a couple of big things, um, big themes coming through here. Um, uh, there's the, the sort of future progress of, of skills that are needed. And then there's the systems and systems, in my mind, systems and systems approach. So I'd like to start there, if I may. We've, uh, we've heard from several French um, uh, the systems approach that people are using or, or needing. Certainly Melanie showed her uh, systems uh, approach um, uh, and I was thinking um, with that for example with UKRI um, Melanie there's your systems approach your students are embedded in universities um, I, I know you, you said that um, uh, you took a lot of input from um, uh, other organizations in building your strategy but then the students are embedded in university um, so my first part is how much do we um, create strategies for um, people um, who are then going embedded in somewhere else who are then um, under some other culture or some other thing has our strategy worked possibly properly um, and building on that with the different sort of areas of science whether it's UKRI and academia the systems approach in, in though, that area, does it mesh well with the systems thinking for, for this in industry? And then internationally as well, thinking about the skills flowing into the country. <clears throat> and then um, as Louise has talked about the skills that are kind of needed in, in other countries, have we got lots of different systems which are clashing together or actually can we mold them to work together um, in a better way? <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. So, uh, Melanie, hi, Artem. Could you talk about how these systems, uh, uh, all these different efforts, could work as a system of systems? Melanie first. Yeah, I'm happy to start off and then hand over. So, it definitely there is a system of systems, and and it depends where how you define your your, your system, and there will be many cultures within 
even one system, even one organization, you know, different departments may have different cultures in a business or in a, in a university. But I think what as as kind of a from a sort of broad funding perspective, it's trying to think what are some of the key features that actually will support a positive culture across that entirety within each of those systems that form the wider ecosystem, if you like. So are there some key principles that we really need people to be considering such that there is um, more harmony perhaps or more similarity and people can actually learn from each other. So I've been really struck talking to a lot of university leaders and then and early career researchers in university as well of how um, much attention they're actually focusing on this, this broader issue around sort of research culture and that inclusivity. So that gives me um, hope that actually people are really wanting to see change and really wanting to affect change. And I think what we can do, I think whilst we're at this sort of stage is learning from what people are doing and sharing that. I think Nick was talking about that. How can we actually share that? Because I don't think we, we're certainly not in a position that would say we have all the answers. This is how what you need to do in order to have a positive system. We're all learning. And I think it's really important that we learn together and we share together. And tomorrow I'm actually um, hosting a discussion as part of the Science Europe high level workshop on research culture, where we're bringing together people across European research performing organisation and funding organisations to discuss this very topic as well, because I think each country will have its own culture and its own system, but what can we learn from others as well? So I think there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of learning and sharing, I think that will be really helpful across those systems. And I'll stop there <laughs> because it's a very big question. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, I'll come in as well. Um, the, I mean, you know, at the Royal Academy of Engineering, we love a system. Systems thinking is, is a big part of what we do here. <laughs> that will surprise nobody. Um, and I also think it's really important when we talk about trying to adopt a systems approach that we remember why we're doing it. And we're doing it to, to make problem solving more tractable and more resilient. And the risk is if you start getting into systems of systems of systems, it just becomes overwhelming. So what that systems view can help you do is to think about where are your points of leverage? What are the points of intersection that you need to be aware of so that, you know, there's an inherent trade off or compromise that you're going to be making? Um, how do you align incentives around your system? So that's an incredibly helpful tool when any organization needs to think about what what's within its power when it wants to improve its its performance on diversity and inclusion. And I think, you know, making sure that one doesn't get overwhelmed with the um, all the intersection points and all the other um, interacting parts of the system is very important in that context, because you focus on which levers do we have control over and how do we use them to best effect. On the other hand, the points that you, know, you Neil, and Nick and Louise all made so powerfully are also very important around collaboration. So that's where the system of systems comes in, from my perspective, because we're saying, how do we work collaboratively to create a, a, a more functional um, system of systems and there actually there's a huge amount that that one can do and, and it's partly about just sharing information putting people who are trying to do similar things in proximity to each other so that we don't all go through our individual learning cycles uh, without understanding someone else has gone through that learned something we can kind of bank that knowledge collectively that's so powerful but we can go further than that and we can create tools that support that shared learning in a more collaborative way. So at the Academy, we convene a whole range of groups across the professional bodies um, and across industry, for example. And those groups um, have co-developed tools, which um, are very user-centric, again, important for a systems uh, perspective. So for example, we have tools around, if you're working in industry, what data do you need to measure in order to understand your DNI performance and to improve it? For professional bodies, we have a, a, a toolkit called a progression framework that helps us understand what's our current maturity in terms of diversity inclusion and enables us to collectively benchmark around the community to say, well, where are we relative to others? And then there's a support group that sits alongside that to help people use that tool effectively and keep on learning. And no matter how much of this we do, there'll still be more that we need to do, but that's, that's really important to our sort of philosophy, if you like, everything's open source. And I would also just note that we do have a funding call out at the moment for um, university departments to uh, pilot different approaches within um, engineering. They can do that in collaboration with anyone else really, um, but we want to then create a cohort of people who are sharing learning across the university system. So again, lots of things that I hope speak to the questions that um, you pose, Neil, thanks. 
Louise or Nick, do you want to add any thoughts? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think, you know, um, as Melanie and Hilton have already covered, you know, it, it's all about thinking of your own system and then how that interacts with the wider system uh, in that system of systems approach. But I think one thing that's key for me really is keeping things simple and uh, standardizing taxonomy or language, um, ensuring that things are in plain English. Um, we all come from different backgrounds with different levels of education with, you know, different knowledge of the English language and we can all interpret things very differently. Um, and my experience, my lived experience is that we're not joined up across industry sectors or, or even wider than that across, you know, wider enterprises in the language that we use. And it can often be quite confusing for early career professionals, you know, people in academia and what well, anyone really, um, if we're not careful in that respect. So I think, you know, a big, I'm a big, big believer in the plain English campaign and making things as simple as possible so that the system can be understood and people can use that system as it's intended to be used. Um, so that's a big one for me. I'm not sure how, what you think, Louise. Yeah, I'd agree definitely that language and making sure that you're that you're bringing everyone with you, that you're not, um, you know, alienating anyone by having things that aren't understandable or accessible. And um, there's a there's a good example in the um, the engineering council. They're working on an international level to to get that sort of engineering alliance, that cross collaboration and that that conversation going um, with lots and lots of different countries so that. Um, where engineers, um, it's a very mobile profession and it allows people to, to speak that common um, language and have that understanding in order to um, be where they need to be. Um, and the other thing um, that you mentioned um, was um, the open source activities that Hyatton mentioned. And um, it's such an important thing to promote public understanding as well and to have the access and, and the shared knowledge in that space because ultimately they're the people that everyone is trying to work to make different societies um, operate, to function, to, to be safe, and making sure there's that public understanding and competency um, really helps to engage and bring new people into, into the relevant professions as well. Great. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'd um, like to just uh, take a slightly different step and think about the future um, future skills that are needed, um, everything from the different sort of engineering, rethinking engineering, the different science and technology that's progressing at a, a rapid pace. Um, uh, Melanie, you talked about four things for um, in your uh, postgrad uh, strategy, and I was, I was wondering if some of the different subjects needed to be um, asked about. How are we moving quickly enough so that the sort of the skills that we're going to need for um whatever's coming in the future and that's you know um uh net zero um whether that's different sort of migration habits whether that's uh, um different uh challenges coming from economics are are these um activities moving quickly enough to respond to those and what sort of um uh, subjects or training narratives do we think we should be um developing uh, in 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 the near term i'm thinking about this part of the conversation yesterday was uh, about net zero was we're not moving quickly enough so trying to fold that into the conversation today are we moving quickly enough what training and skills changes should we see in the near future hey Arthur, perhaps you'd like to start there <laughs> and neil i don't think any of us could say that we're moving fast enough and it doesn't mean we're not trying very hard and the pace is I would say accelerating. I mean, even the, the dominance of this topic has rapidly grown and that reflects the fact that many more of us are worrying about it. Um, in some ways, what's needed is rather similar to what we've been discussing in terms of diversity and inclusion. We need collaboration. We need to be creative in the sorts of approaches that we're taking. Um, I certainly can say within engineering, I mean, it's funny, I think Louise used the term, you know, what does a future engineer look like? That's a question that we're asking ourselves right now and, and may well do a, a deeper piece of work. It's embedded in everything we do. But I mean, this is something I feel in the UK is, is a real opportunity for us is that we have such a good understanding of where the leading edge of, of all the technologies are that are going to be shaping our response to the future. You know, we really do understand. We have amazing strengths in our research base. We really do understand how um, technology is going to impact our life and help us meet these huge societal and, and global grand challenges. 
but yet that is insufficiently connected to the system that we use to provide education and skills to people who are our future workforce and our current workforce. And so I think tightening that feedback loop is a very, very important part of how we get there faster. And I think there is a great awareness of this and lots of us are doing what we can both to influence the policy debate around this, but also in the context of the professional groupings and things to try and get that tighter feedback loop. I think we need to be really sympathetic to the fact that the majority of people who are supposed to be delivering this training in a very you know, progressive way themselves have come through a totally different system. And so one of the things that the academy we do, and I know lots of others do, and I think it's going to be a really important contribution um, if we can all get behind it, is it helping to upskill the people who are the educators, um, whether that's in universities, whether that's in schools, so that they, for example, have the opportunity to go and do secondments in industry, so that we bring industrialists into the um, lecture theatre, into the classroom, to help support the people who are delivering education, to understand the real world environment that those students are going to be going into. So I think improving the, the, the efficiency of that feedback loop is is, is one of the things that we can do better. We know we can do better. Some of the stuff seems a bit overwhelming, but I also do think there is a longer term shift that we're not yet close to around um, this sort of linear siloed model of education. I'm being a bit rude, you know, there's lots of things so great about it, but in terms of what does the future look like? I mean, fast forward decades, and I don't think we'll be teaching in these boxes to the same extent that we are today. It's ridiculous that people have to make decisions when they're 14 about whether they're going to be in STEM or not in STEM, but that's effectively what we're asking people to do. So I think that there is a wider societal shift that, that will come downstream of, of the work that we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie, if you've uh, got some thoughts on it. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it depends how far into the future we're actually looking. And probably we can say in five years time, what sort of skills we might need. Data skills, data scientists is something which I hear a lot from different parts of the community, that there, that there is a real, um, a real need for more data scientists or uh, people with, with those types of skills. Um, but in 10 and 15 years time, we can't necessarily predict what we're actually going to need. So I think we need to think about how we can support people to actually to move across those different sectors so that they can actually learn skills. And maybe that's part of that sort of retraining. But I think we have to be more accepting. I mean, and, you know, I know within academia, it has been quite unusual for people to move in and out of academia from different sectors. We've actually got to normalise that because I think this is going to be really important. Um, and, you know, we support sort of training where um, there are elements of professional support for those students that we're training the postgraduate students um, and that's actually really beneficial but it hasn't always been um, university popular with the university supervisors because they see as that distracting the students from their research work so I think there is still quite a lot that we have to think about but I think those different lived experiences within someone's career pathway I think are really important we need to think about how we can support those how we can value those how we can encourage more of those um, but I agree that with Hayton that we really need to think about those feedback loops between business between tertiary education secondary education even primary education because I actually think a lot of a lot of um, young people are kind of have, have almost switched off from certain areas even before they get to secondary education as well we really need to think about sort of that but it's incredibly long there's an incredibly long time scale there as well um, but I think there is more than it could do. And I think we have examples of where that's starting to happen as well. Thank you for that. Um, so in my own experience, as um, <clears throat> I'm involved in something called STEM Futures, which many people on the call will um, know about. And um, one of the issues that we faced uh, when we, amongst the other institutions that work with STEM Futures, is everyone says this is so it's just a common uh, opportunity for people with a structure to respond in and out of, of various organizations, uh, industry, uh, sort of defense, uh, security, and um, academia. Um, uh, all the partnering organizations say, Yeah, this is great. And then we're kind of left with this who can you send? And everyone wants to receive. <laughs> no one has a spare member of staff to say. So, so the, the point is that there's external stresses. On, on this mobility, there's external stresses on the organisations that, that really crush that, that sort of mobility. Um, so is there, um, is there a sense that uh, these uh, schemes and mobility ideas 
um, can unlock it or are they doomed to always be a lower priority to the immediate demands of whatever organization? Are you happy for me to jump in on that, Melanie? Thanks. Um, I mean, we, we've been running mobility schemes for decades at the Academy and I would say that demand is very healthy actually. Um, and like all things in life, if you just sort of wait till you comes forward, you get a different result from if you reach down a bit further into the system and try and create a bit more of a pull factor. But at the end of the day, as in all of these discussions about diversity and inclusion as well, you know, there is a there is a real issue around incentives and jeopardy. So it's easier to drive change when there is a clear perceived win for an individual or an organization. And what's happening at the moment and what we're all, I think, part of in our own ways of, of helping to drive forward is creating greater incentive, greater benefit for doing all of these different types of enhancement of, of our community and the skills in our community and the diversity in our community and increasing the jeopardy with failing to embrace that. So in the context of a, of a country like Germany or the US or Singapore, there is, if you're in engineering, there is a lot of benefit and so, some, there's a lot of benefit in having experience in industry if you're an academic and some jeopardy in failing to do that in the same way that lacking international experience if you're an academic in the UK tends to be something that's you know, not helpful to your career. And so what we want to do is to get to a stage where people, are, people see this as, as an embodiment of excellence and an enhancement. I see in the context of business, much, much, much greater sense of urgency around the business case for all of this kind of broader skills enhancement, diversity and inclusion. People see this as a risk to the future success of their business if they don't embrace this more. Now I'm talking about the kind of progressive end, there's a long tail and I get that. And typically that's the case in corporates, but still it's a big step forward that people see this business case for diversity and inclusion that Melanie set out. And I would say alongside that, there's a lot of stuff around mobility and a lot of stuff around sustainability um, as being, you know, those are necessary conditions of this being an attractive business uh, a business where they're not beating off uh, a revolt from their shareholders, a business where the best talent wants to work there and stay there. And so we're, we're on that trajectory. We're all at different places. We need to accelerate. <laughs> I would just say that I, I agree with all of that. I, mean, I don't really think I have very much, very much to add. Okay, Nick or Louise, how about you? Um, just one quick thing. I, I agree, definitely, you know, competitive economy, you need a skilled workforce and it's, it's incentivizing that across industry academia, getting them um, to really work together, um, modernizing training curriculums, making that holistic approach where they where they can train in different um, environments um, and also um, making sure that there's other levels of training beyond just the sort of the technical skills and the discipline skills that they're, that they're entering into. That public engagement and communication skill is so key to, to bring the policymakers, to bring the public with them in that journey as well, um, to show you know, the value of having that skilled workforce force is, is beyond just doing the day job. It's actually um, incentivizing other people to come into the profession as well. Yeah, to build on that, I suppose, um, and to give a bit of a case study, I mean, within defence, we, we've recognised that we aren't as joined up with our academic interfaces we need to be. Um, we don't communicate a demand signal as such through to our academic interface to say, look, these are the skills we need now and these are the skills we will need for the future. I mean, across the Ministry of Defence, we ran an engineering skills survey in 2020 and unsurprisingly, systems engineering, you know, the word systems has come up a lot today, came out as the, as the skill that we would need in the future most. And, and since that point, through the Defence Suppliers Forum, uh, which is a forum made up of uh, obviously the, the, the Ministry of Defence and its key suppliers, We've established an academic interface working group where we are reaching out to a set of universities and academic providers to understand how we can best communicate those demand signals and how we can help them and how they can help us. So, you know, in a collaborative effort to a provide them with um, learning materials, uh, opportunities to come and do site visits, opportunities, you know, to do industry secondments or placements, uh, mentorship schemes. Uh, from our side, but also how they can help us by growing the engineers of the future and making them work ready um, in providing the right skills, the right you know technic technical skills and soft skills for you know the the industry that we work in. 
so I'm really you know passionate about that and I've been involved in that work and it's only just started to sort of mature into a space where we're seeing some activity take place but I'm really hopeful that that will build quite a solid foundation for us to act off in future and and build that bridge between you know um, the defense enterprise that's not necessarily widely advertised um, and you know the academic academic space who obviously can provide you know engineers of the future scientists of the future uh, to help us you know continue to make the industry a success okay Thank you uh, for that, uh, for those thoughts. Um, I'm just going to change tack slightly for the last section and sort of come down in scale a little bit and think about individual uh, people. So I'll, I'll try and lump together a number of questions and possibly paraphrase them, hopefully accurately. Um, so there's a number of questions about people's individual experience um, in whatever institution. Uh, and I'll give a, a number of sort of sub questions together and then sort of launch them uh, at the panel. Um, so uh, do you think there's adequate support for postgrads who raise concerns over culture, bullying, harassment, bias, inequality, etc.? So, um, so is there enough support for those who say enough support for mental health and personal support? Uh, equally, uh, another similar question, if you are involved, um, uh, if you're experiencing a woman in STEM who's experiencing gender bias, how would that person address it in, in the workplace? Now, we're not asking for a, a workshop on it at the moment, but how, how can that person a, a address it uh, in their workplace? Um, and uh, sort of the counterpoint to those, uh, we're seeing some um, additional awardees to in sort of professional institution um, awards um, that sort of improving pictures for women receiving um, awards. How should those uh, people um, build on the awards so that they, they, they can remain or still be leaders or um, capitalize, sorry, on the award that they've got to uh, improve the, the subject of EDNI. So, sort of, so three little groups there. Um, if you're a person in the midst of an institution suffering somehow, what should that person be doing, and do they have support? And then, if they there is someone who's receiving uh, a woman receiving awards, how can they capitalise to improve EDNI? Who would like to go first? Uh, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tackle one part of the question. <laughs> multi-dimensional um in terms of i guess the, there was a, question, a particular point around postgraduate support um in across a whole range of areas about raising issues around research culture or is there enough support for mental health so i would say that it undoubtedly it will be variable and experiences will be variable depending on the 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 department or the institution but i think one of the things that we have done within bbsrc and i know other councils in ukri is actually as part of our assessment process when we're awarding those doctoral training partnerships we actually want to understand sort of the broad the the broader pastoral support if you like that is provided to those students so i think we you know obviously the excellence of the training the technical aspects of that is important but it's actually broader than that so it's recognizing how you actually support the broader needs and skills development of that cohort and we have actually used that criteria we have not awarded doctoral training partnerships where we have felt that that has not been of the level mm -hmm. that we would wish it to be or the evidence hasn't been there from previous awards so we've taken you know we take that incredibly seriously that doesn't guarantee that everyone has a consistent experience. And so uh, undoubtedly, and I think with the pandemic, it has put incredible pressure on many people in the system. So undoubtedly we need to do more, but we need to support everyone across the system, I think, to be able to support that. Um, I think in terms of those, um, you know, women who've been, uh, who've, who've been lucky enough to receive awards, I think, you know, just keep doing, the, the great work that you're doing and think about um, you know, how you can develop your own leadership to help bring about and contribute to that change that we've been talking about here today. And you can play a role. Yeah, it's an incredibly complex system of systems, but each individual has a really important opportunity to contribute 
to the future. So I would just really encourage that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Shall you. I come in next, Neil? Thanks. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so let me pick up um, on the issue of women in STEM exp experiencing gender bias. So I think it's really important to segment this question into stuff that needs to be dealt with through an HR process or even escalated beyond that. So that is absolutely vital. If you genuinely are experiencing gender bias in your workplace, that should be addressed through the HR policies and processes that exist to protect everybody. And if you don't find you're getting what you need through line management, through HR, there are other routes to escalate that you may have employee assistance programs, you may have access to a trade union and so forth. I think like that is, I, I never want to talk about how women can navigate this problem without pointing out that there is stuff that is illegal and it is a breach of policy. So that put that in a separate category. Then in terms of assuming that's all being dealt with and it doesn't fall into that kind of category of experience, you know, so thinking of more of the sort of the internal um, factors. Um, uh, I think, as Melanie said, the most important thing is don't give up because actually we need more people to persist in the face of some adversity in order to have a set of leaders across our communities that do embody this more inclusive mindset and that will help create better cultures. So you no doubt will need support to get there. It's, you know, I'm not saying soldier on by yourself, but but don't give up because of that. If there are other reasons to give up, of course, that's legitimate. But don't give up just because you're experiencing um, adversity in that context. Things that I have found immensely helpful are things like peer mentoring. So I have an amazing group of people around me. You know, people talk about role models being these people on pedestals. Role models are often, if you're lucky, someone sitting across the desk opposite you. So, you know, find your crowd of people who will help you um, both to kind of emotionally be supported, but also to think quite pragmatically about how to tackle whatever you might be experiencing. Also very important is call it out or get other people to help you call it out. Because the chances are, if you're experiencing that, other people are experiencing too. It's wrong. People talk about this stuff as being microaggressions. They're not microaggressions. They're just behaviours that are unacceptable in the workplace. And raising awareness and understanding of that is an important first step to, to battling it. And in all of this, we talk about diversity, diversity, but inclusion is so critical. Inclusion is something everyone can contribute to and everyone can benefit from. So we need the people in the majority groups often white men, to be playing their full part as allies, as inclusive leaders. And so it's finding the route to some of those people calling it out rather than you having to do it that often starts to shift things. Um, so there are lots of other things I could say, but I know we're short of time, so I'll, st I'll stop at that point. But I really, I really wish everyone success in their efforts to do this. And for those of us that do climb through, those of you that get awards, I hate this phrase, but it actually does mean something useful, leverage your privilege. When you, have, when you have the floor, when you have a position of, of authority, use it to make sure you create spaces where other people can really, really benefit. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for those. So, uh, yeah, we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, Nick and uh, Louise, are there any last thoughts that you would uh, want to put in? Um, just a, a quick final one for me. I think behaviours is certainly growing on the agenda. It, certainly in my short career, I've seen a vast amount of change within my organisation around the way in which we educate people on behaviours and monitor, measure behaviours. Um, and unacceptable behaviours are being stamped out more, more frequently and people are having the confidence to do so. So that really fills me with benefit. And I also see, you know, aspirational young engineers, you know, a, a young safety engineer that I, I mentor, uh, took a decision to invite um, out, outliers within the organisation into one of our safety panels, where we, which we used to, you know, identify hazards associated with equipment. And that, and when asked, okay, why did you invite these people? He said, well, I wanted a difference in perspective. I wanted an understanding from, you know, a woman's perspective or someone from with protected characteristics. I needed their perspective to understand what hazards they might experience. And that was you know huge for me that, that shows the next generation of people are thinking more widely are thinking more inclusively hmm. um so you know i think behaviors change culture changes it just takes time um, and we just we've got to keep at it this is the long and short of it great Louise? I'll just quickly add to that, Nick, it's, um, I attended a, a workshop um, last week sometime and it was one of the key things in getting young people and new people into the workforce to encouraging the new skills and the new generations. A lot of them look at what is the cultural value, values of the organisation that we're going to join? Do they have a proper EDI policy? Um, what do they do? Do they call out bad behaviours? Um, so it's those societal infrastructures, that cultural change that's so important. 
um, and you can't have you can't have innovation without that. You can't accomplish it without equity and justice. So, um, nice important link for your next session, Neil. <laughs> it is a very excellent. Yes, our last session is coming coming up in uh, after our tea break. I'm going to give one final chance for Hayatum and Melanie. Would you challenge us, listening, please, to what we can go away and do this week and this month on this subject? So I would challenge you to think of one thing that you could do that make a difference. It's not just this week, it's not just this month, but it's in, you know, for the next year, for the next two years, you know, positive, positive actions, I guess, that you could take away from this conversation. Thank you. And I was going to say something similar, which is that we have more power, each of us, than we probably realise. So please be an active shaper of how we deliver better diversity, inclusion and equity across STEM. And I think if you start on that process of thinking, I do have power, you'll start to realise the ways in which you can make a real difference to the people around you and from there to amplify that and influence wider change. Um, so that would be my, my ask to everybody. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Melanie, hi Artem, it's been an absolute privilege talking with you this morning. Uh, we really thank you for your time and your efforts and for Louise and Nick to uh, giving your uh, contributions and insights in, the, uh, in this subject. So I'll draw this um, to a close now and just remind everyone to come back in at 11.30 for the next session, which is on innovating for change in the sustainable future. Thank you again, everyone. Bye. Thank you.